Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Children's Mental Health Learning Series. My name is Christina Tortorelli, and I'm an Executive Manager with Calgary and Area Child and Family Services with the Ministry of Human Services. So I would like to personally welcome all of you to the Children's Mental Health Learning Series. Human Services staff asked for information that will help them better support children and families. With that in mind, these sessions are designed for Human Services staff, foster parents, service providers, caregivers, and parents. Children with ADHD often experience negative outcomes in their lives, such as academic failure, substance abuse, and peer rejection. In order to effectively support these children, we must develop a greater understanding of their diagnosis. Then we can promote positive outcomes through our schools, communities, programs, and services. In this fourth session of the series, Emma Climey will be speaking to us about children with a diagnosis of Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. Dr. Climey is the principal investigator of the Strengths in ADHD Research Lab. Her research focuses on children with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, resilience, children's mental health and mental well-being, school-based intervention, and strength-based assessment. Dr. Climey is interested in better understanding the areas in which children are successful and using these areas of strength to support areas of deficit. Dr. Climey has also authored and co-authored a number of publications. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Emma Climey. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you for, for coming and uh, for being here this morning. Um, and for the lovely introduction, as you can see, uh, my name is Emma Climey. I am a professor at the University of Calgary. Uh, I'm in the school psychology program, so I kind of walk the line between uh, the psychology side of things, but also working within educational contexts primarily. So my research has always been focused on children who um, are at risk for having difficulties or who may be seen in a bit of a, a negative light. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about ADHD more broadly and then talk about some of the, the work that I've done uh, through ACCFCR, through some of the other research projects I have going on, and talk about some of the interventions and practices that we can put into place to be able to support these children. So I put, I'll put this up here, hopefully it's clear enough to be able to see. This is kind of one of the ways that I look at working with kids with ADHD. This is how parents often describe working with kids with ADHD. Um, so I'll just give you a second to look at it because I, I won't read it out. But you can see that this is actually pretty sort of accurate in terms of how you see them. They're, they're able to focus on one thing, but then their mind wanders. Um, pretty quickly and actually ironically I was at a girl guide camp this weekend and a squirrel did run by and all the kids did look over and it was one of those things where I kind of thought oh it's you know it actually does work hey look a squirrel the squirrel went by um, oh. uh, so when we think about children with ADHD what kind of words come to mind what kind of things do you think of when if I was to say children with ADHD hyper, hyper yeah what else busy Sorry? Lacks, yeah, lacks focus? Restless? Yeah, so there's any number of words we come up with. And when we ask parents and teachers, these are some of the words that they had come up with to, um, to describe children with ADHD. And you can see from looking at this list here, there's a number of them that have um, a positive connotation and a number of them that have a more negative connotation. So you can see the uh, defiant, disorganized, irresponsible, challenging, jittery, these are all the words that they use to describe them in sort of a negative context. But you can see there's also a lot of uh, positive words that have come out of here. So there's fun, intelligent, active, creative, uh, enthusiastic. So you can see that there are ways that we can look at these children. It's just sometimes um, some of the more negative behaviors or the more prevalent ones are the ones that we focus on a little bit more. And so that's where the research that I'm bringing in kind of comes into play is that I'm trying to balance that a little bit more. So it's less of a focus primarily on deficits and more of a better understanding of the child as a whole. So when we look more generally at ADHD, uh, we can see that it's a relatively large um, sample of children, or a relatively large uh, prevalence rate. 
These are American statistics. They're not a lot different in Canada. So we're looking at about 10% of kids may have a diagnosis of ADHD. So if you think about a classroom of um, 25 to 30 kids, you're looking at two to three kids in that classroom environment that may have a diagnosis. Um, then there may be some that may not actually have a diagnosis at this point. We know that boys are more likely to be diagnosed than girls. Um, there is some controversy as to whether that's uh, actually the case, of whether boys do have more um, are more often, well, they are more often diagnosed, but whether that's truly the case or whether girls just sort of don't get identified as easily. So um, right now the prevalence rates are a little bit different. We do see it more often in boys um, than in girls. We do see it across all ethnic backgrounds, races, genders, ages. Um, most of the time we see the symptoms do continue into adolescence and into adulthood. What we often find is that adults are better, have developed coping strategies or developed ways to sort of manage some of the symptoms associated with ADHD. So they may be able to better cope with the situation, but um, given the neurological basis of ADHD, we would say they still present with some of those types of symptoms. There's definitely a history of blaming parents and blaming children. There's a lot of misconceptions that come into ADHD, and I'll talk about that. That's one of the newer research projects I'm looking at is how do we understand what's actually facts and what is just sort of misconceptions that, that people have about the disorder. And I think one of the big things that we do know is that ADHD is often a disorder of performance. So it's not that they don't know what to do, it's not that they don't understand or that they're not intelligent children, it's that just in that moment they're not able to do what they know. So on a playground, if a child is impulsive and they hit another child, if you just say to that child, what should you have done, 95% of the time they know the answer to that question. They know what they should have done in this situation. It's just the impulsivity and the hyperactivity that sort of prevent them from acting in the way that they know that they should. So it's, it's kind of keeping that balance in mind that it's not necessarily a deficit in what they understand, but sometimes more of a deficit in what they actually demonstrate. So as I said, ADHD does have a strong neuro, neurological basis or neurobiological basis. Um, so we do know that the way that the brains of these children are wired are slightly different than children with ADHD, um, primarily focused in the front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. That's kind of the area of the brain that helps us control actions and, and behaviors. And I'll give you some example of, of what that looks like. But when we know that there's a neurological basis for a disorder, what we know is that there's reasons and rationales for why they act in, the, in specific ways. It's not necessarily behavioral. It's not necessarily just them being defiant or saying, no, I'm not going to do something. Often we do see links to those neurological uh, components that help to explain some of the behaviors that we see. So we can go, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but we can go into the literature and we can look for neurological reasons for why they're continually talking and moving, why there's poor reading comprehension, why they may have difficulties with social skills, why some of their adaptive skills are a bit more limited. We can look at some of those neurological connections that do actually provide some explanation as to why they may have difficulties in these areas. So when we're looking at ADHD at home, I'm sure parents can list a, a whole number of things that they would see in, in, in their children. Um, there's often, when we talk to parents and, and looking at doing diagnoses, these are some of the questions that we would ask about or some of the behaviors we'd look for. So are they able to sit for, for sustained periods of time? Are they able to complete tasks? Are they able to remember, you know, first you do this, then you do this, then you do that? Are they able to look at multi-step instructions? Um, how well do they get along with their siblings or their peers? Let's talk about frustration tolerance and, and temper. Often those are things that can be somewhat problematic in children with ADHD as well. So these are some of the first things that parents often start to notice. They may not necessarily relate them to ADHD, but often when we talk to parents, these are some of the common um, challenges that, that arise with, with these children. In the classroom, we know that teachers are often one of the first um, adults in a child's life to identify that there may be concerns with attention. Uh, usually that's because they've got 25 to 30 kids in the class and the ones that can't sit still and aren't paying attention often stand out a little bit more for them. We do know that there's often highly comorbid learning difficulties that come along with ADHD as well. So we see that these kids often have difficulties with reading, with writing, with math. Um, primarily coming from some of the ADHD type uh, symptoms and behavior as well. 
When we look at it in terms of reading, we see they're quite good at recognizing words, decoding words, individual words. They're, they're quite good at getting those words off the page. But where they have difficulty is in the comprehension side of things. So they can start reading a sentence at the beginning. By the time they've got to the end of the sentence, they've forgotten what the beginning of the sentence says, which is really problematic if you're looking at comprehension. So if they're reading a paragraph or if they're reading a chapter or a story, a lot of times they can get the information as they go through, but they can't retain that information in mind in order to be able to answer questions or comprehension, um, comprehension questions at the end, I guess. When we look at writing, we often see there's difficulties with spelling, with editing, with coming up with uh, types of ideas. We can see that often these kids are very creative. They've got a million different ideas as, as to how to answer something, but can't actually narrow it down to something that they can manageably work with or make a plan to be able to move forward. So we often see that the planning and the organization and the, uh, is, is an area that they do have some difficulty. And even just the physical act of writing is often a challenge for these kids. So the fine motor skills can be underdeveloped. So picking up a pencil and, and writing and keeping it on the lines and having the spaces between the words, often we see that can be problematic for these children as well. And mathematics, so just remembering basic math facts, um, careless errors, so being going on a, on a list of questions. If there's addition and subtraction mixed up together, quite often they just see an addition and will do all of the addition questions, but won't notice that the signs have changed. If they have to copy things out, often you get numbers that are misaligned. So a lot of sort of the careless errors, the organizational errors that lead to overall problems in mathematics, because if you can't do some of these basic things, then moving on to more advanced skills is, is often quite challenging. <coughs> Excuse me. So we can see that when we look at the, the list of sort of behaviors and symptoms and things that we see in the classroom that may be problematic, um, ADHD often comes up as something that is you know, flagged. Teacher says, oh, it has ADHD, we need to, you know, get started on the medication and get this solved, which is uh, one of the challenges that I <laughs> routinely try to overcome with dealing with, um, dealing with parents and, and teachers, is that there's a lot of things that look like ADHD. And so just to say, you know, he can't sit still, you know, it must be ADHD, it often sort of jumps ahead to uh, a solution that may not actually be the problem. So I do, I mean, as, as a psychologist, I advocate for having assessments that are done that actually provide you with the information to look and distinguish between a number of different um, types of behaviors that can actually look like ADHD. Yeah? Sorry, just one more question. When you talk about ADHD, are you also talking about ADD or just ADHD? Um, Do they fall into the same category? Yes and no. ADHD, so ADD is, uh, has kind of been, the, the term ADD is, kind of a passe way of looking at things. So now we talk about ADHD, and then there's different sort of subtypes that we talk about within that, which I think I will get into in a little bit here. So I'll talk about that as well. Uh, do I have to repeat questions if on yeah. the microphone? OK. The then I'll repeat the questions? OK. Uh, so when we look at the ADHD behaviors, um, you can see that a child who's having difficulty paying attention in class um, may have fatigue. It may be that there's something that's going on at home that's causing some difficulties. It may be that um, there's some stress that's going on at home that's causing them to not pay attention in class. They may be anxious. They may be depressed. They may have learning challenges. There may be um, intellectual difficulties that are going on. So just by having, by saying, here's a couple of symptoms that we see of ADHD, there can be a number of explanations that actually explain those behaviors. And just by kind of painting all children with the same brush, you often sort of miss, in some of the, miss out on some of the, the nuances of individual children that are really important when we're looking at um, being able to support them at school. Cool. There we go. So one of the key areas that we do see difficulties with um, in children with ADHD is something we call executive functions. And this ties in very closely to the neurological side of things. So we do know throughout the literature that's a pretty common um, understanding of children with ADHD is that they do have difficulties in sort of the more broad cognitive processes. So we use the word executive function to describe these higher order ways of thinking. So being able to switch between tasks, being able to um, inhibit responses, so being able to wait in line, being able to sort of wait their turn for something, um, 
I'll, I'll give you some examples of what these tasks look like. But what, it, what we look at here is executive functions tie into organizing, prioritizing, memory plays into this as well. Uh, managing frustration is a huge one that plays into that. Inhibiting behaviors, planning, sort of all of these things that we need to do to be able to manage our everyday lives. It has nothing to, nothing to do with intelligence necessarily. It's how do we sort of demonstrate these skills? How do we talk about um, behaviors that sort of relate to ADHD but also relate to the home and the classroom environment? So I talk about executive function as sort of like the boss in a company. So we have to have sort of an organization system or a management system in order for a company to effectively operate. So the executive function is kind of like the boss in charge at the very top. And if this boss is very well organized, is able to plan, is able to um, dic you know, provide direction to all of the employees, the company runs relatively well. But if that person at the top is disorganized, um, doesn't have a, a plan or can't really organize things very well, then the company is, is much less able to kind of get things done. So when we think about executive functions, we see it in that way. So the executive functions help us get from point A to point B. So when I got up this morning, I had to brush my teeth, I needed to put my shoes on, I needed to eat breakfast, I needed to you know, do all of these things in an order. And executive functions and sort of that overall big boss mentality help me get all of these things done in an in appropriate manner. Whereas if I don't have an organization system like that, it makes it much more difficult for a child to be able to move through things in that kind of a sequential order. So one of the things that we do when children come for assessment is we do some of these executive function tasks. We look specifically at how do we um, measure executive functions, how do we understand what they're able to do. Um, and then that gives us an indication of whether they're able to do some of these tasks or whether they have a little bit of difficulty. So I put some in here for us to kind of go through and try. So you can give you an idea as to what, um, what these kids go through in terms of doing assessment, but what executive functions actually look, look at. So I'm going to ask for a couple of volunteers in here, and the, the slides are on, uh, included on here, so the people who are online can either do it within their groups or they can kind of try it on th with themselves as well. All right, so the first one. So can I have first volunteer here? Okay, so what I want you to do is I just want you to go through and I want you to read these words out loud. Yellow, red, green, blue, red, yellow. Good. So you go through and you can see that this is a pretty straightforward task. Sometimes kids get tripped up because they're trying to go too fast or they think it's so easy and they want to get through things. You can see it's a pretty straightforward type task. So who's going to try the next one? Okay, we got, we've got a couple more. Yeah, we'll wait for that. I won't turn the slide just yet. <laughs> nope, now I'll do the next one. All right, so for the next one, I want you to go through and I want you to tell me the colors that you see here. Red, green. All right, so I should have specified you should read left to right across the rows. <laughs> okay, so there you go. So there's someone thinking outside the box. So um, yeah, as you go through here, this one is a little bit more challenging because there's different colors and often kids get mixed up on different rows or sometimes they have a hard time following along. Um, but yeah, as you, as you read through, I, you can kind of figure out where she was going. It was a bit more of a, a cognitive task to figure she's going up and down. Um, but it, what it does is it gives you an idea of how quickly the kids can look at things that are, don't have... Uh, words associated with them. So we have one more for the, with the visual side of things. Another volunteer? Yeah, one here. All right, so for this one, what I want, would like you to do is you go through, start on the top left and work along this way. Um, and I want you to tell me the color of the ink that everything is written in. Okay. Blue, green, red, blue, yellow, blue, blue, green, yellow, Red, green, yellow, red, blue, green, red, blue, red, yellow, green, red, blue, red, yellow, blue, green, 
yellow, and green. Good job. That was Very difficult. Good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't look like it should be that hard. You just look at it and you think, oh, I should be able to do that. But it is actually a pretty challenging task to go through because when you look at that, the first thing you want to do is you want to read the, read the words. That's sort of the prepotent response that we get. So when we ask kids, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do the, the more challenging task. That's where they start to get frustrated. Uh, I didn't put the more challenging one on there. There is actually a fourth level of this where there's boxes around some of the words, and if it's in the box, you read the word, and if it's not in the box, you have to say the color of the ink. So I didn't put that one in there. But it does get harder, and there's <laughs> children get very frustrated <laughs> towards the end. So do adults, actually. But it gives you an idea of being able to kind of switch back and forth. And we, just, we have one more that we're going to do, sorry, <laughs> with microphone. So I have one more volunteer. This one's a verbal one, not a visual one. We have one more person who will volunteer. I teach undergraduates. I wait a long time for people to volunteer. <laughs> it's not a tough one. Yeah. Okay. So for this one, um, this is a verbal task. So the first two are the visual side of things. I want you to go back and forth and list as many articles of clothing and vegetables as you can. So you would switch back and forth. So for example, socks, carrots, shoes, you kind of keep going that way. So switching between categories. Okay. <laughs> All right. Socks, carrots, shoes, potatoes, hat, peas, sweater, beans, coat, turnips, gloves, um, spinach, boots, beets. Underwear. <laughs> Good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Am I at well, 30 seconds? Yeah, no, yet? we'll stop there. Yeah. Well, you could see it's another of those things where we could have gone through, and if I had said, list me all the vegetables you could, you could have come up with 20 or 30 vegetables. List me all the clothes. You could have easily come up with that. But this is the whole idea of cognitive flexibility. Switching back and forth between activities is much more difficult for us as adults. Um, and for children with ADHD, this is definitely an area they see some challenge. So as I was talking about with the math, if there's a page of questions that have a and subtraction on them, being able to switch between those two can be a huge challenge for them. So there's ways that we can get around things like that, but it's just sort of the awareness of what that actually looks like in these kids. So these are some of the examples of tasks that we would do with children if they were to come for an assessment to look at you know, aspects of executive function, looking at their verbal skills, looking at their visual skills, looking to see where we can find areas they need support and where we can find areas that they're, they're doing pretty well. All right, so that's sort of the overall, sort of the overview of ADHD. I'm going to talk a little bit about the whole idea of resilience as well. So when we talk about resilience, um, we're sort of talking about how do these kids, how are these kids successful? So some statistics that kind of tie into the ADHD side of things. 40% of children with ADHD have learning disabilities. Up to 30% of children with ADHD have comorbid or co-occurring anxiety. 40% of children with ADHD have uh, more significant behavioral concerns, so the oppositional dis defiant disorders, um, so yeah, more of the, the behavioral difficulties. So we can see that, you know, if you've got a child with ADHD, they're at a pretty high risk for having some of these other challenges as well. But when we look at this on the flip side, we can also see that 60% of these children don't have learning difficulties. 85% uh, or 70 to 85% don't have anxiety. 60% don't have these further behavioral difficulties. So what I'm really interested in is what makes these kids different? What is it that might be different about these children who don't develop these uh, additional concerns? And how do we use that information to support children maybe when they first get a diagnosis or when they first um, are identified as having attention concerns so that we don't, um, or so that we prevent them from sort of going downhill and, and developing some of these other things. So we're interested in knowing what makes these children resilient. Despite the fact they have ADHD, they don't develop some of these other difficulties. So when we talk about resilience, what we talk about is understanding that in the presence of some kind of adversity, so say a diagnosis of ADHD, these children are able to be successful. They're able to do well. Um, we want to understand what factors in their lives, their in, you know, about their individual lives, their family lives, their school, their community, what factors there have helped them overcome some of the challenges associated with ADHD so that they are more successful. As I said, we can look at these protective factors at any number of levels. Uh, some of the things are a little bit 
easier to manipulate and some of the things aren't. Um, typically intelligence is something we see as highly protective, so having higher levels of intelligence often means children are better able to manage. Um, but unfortunately that's not something we can necessarily change, it's a little bit more um, predetermined. Uh, whereas we do know that support from family and schools is also a really important factor as well. And that is something that we may be able to influence. We may be able to have some impact uh, in those areas to support these children. When we look at protective factors, we can talk about this with all children. We're not necessarily looking specifically at children with ADHD. Obviously this research is, is much more broadly focused and I'm kind of tying it in specifically to, um, to children with ADHD. What we've seen previously with ADHD is that all of the research, all of the literature has focused on the deficits. We know a lot about what these kids can't do. That's what stacks and stacks and years and years of research have looked at, is understanding how they're different from typically developing children. You know, we want to focus on how do we reduce these negative symptoms, how do we work on those areas of weakness. But the flip side of that is that there's a lot of kids that are successful. They have ADHD and they use it to their advantage or they are able to develop coping strategies and they're able to kind of put things in place that allow them to be successful. And so that's where we start to bring in this whole idea of the resilience model, is how do we understand the, the risks that they have, but how do we also understand the assets that are in place? How do we understand what works for these kids and we capitalize on those strengths? So we're not necessarily excluding or ignoring the fact that they have challenges. We don't, we want to look at the child as a whole, so we're not just saying, you know, ignore all of the things that are challenging. But what we want to do is look at enhancing the things that they do well and using those strengths to capitalize on uh, areas of difficulty or help strengthen those areas, um, help strengthen the areas that they need additional supports. <coughs> okay. So how do we do that? One of the things that we can do is we can look at children who are successful, children who have ADHD, who are uh, more successful. What kind of factors do we see in their families and in their schools and in their communities? Uh, what kind of supports have they had? What kind of interactions do they have with peers? How can we sort of replicate some of those things in other children or in children that may be having uh, a little bit more difficulty? And that's kind of where my research comes in. I'm not. I'll talk about a couple of the projects I have going on, primarily because some of them are more intervention focused. Um, but the, the research that I'm doing is uh, part of the, well, I'm with the Strengths in ADHD Lab at the University of Calgary. I'm really interested in looking at how do we understand the primary research and how do we link that to intervention. I think uh, I've had a few conversations with people. We've talked about the, the idea that it's 10 to 20 years to get research from the universities actually into the schools. So what we're doing now, we hope, you know, We'd like to speed up that process, but the links between the primary research that's done and the interventions that come out of it is often delayed by 15 to 20 years, and so that's problematic in and of itself. So the best practices that we're looking at, we want to be able to bring into the schools a little bit sooner. So that's why some of the research that I'm doing now is actually school-based intervention. We're in schools, we're trying to support these kids um, in building their capacity now rather than waiting for you know, 10 years for this to come out. So the three projects, three primary projects I have going on, uh, I'll talk a little bit about each of them and sort of what um, some of the directions that I have and some of the results that have come out of those and how it ties into sort of building capacity in, in these children with ADHD. The first project, um, is we called it the Strengths Project. Um, this was the project that we had funded by ACCFCR. And what we did here is we looked at sort of a large scale understanding of children's social emotional well-being. So we were really looking at how did they manage themselves within their community, within their families, with their peers, how were they able to sort of develop those coping strategies and what kind of strengths did we see in the family, what kind of things did we see at schools that really helped them be successful. Uh, yeah, so I said that. Um, so what we really were focused on is understanding them within their everyday environments. And that's one of the, the critics that we've, criticisms we've seen in the research is that often we see kids who are sort of taken out and put into lab settings and it's a very artificial kind of way of looking at children, whereas we were interested in talking to teachers, talking to parents, sort of getting an understanding of everyday life, not sort of the artificial 
um, sort of laboratory-based settings with the idea that we want to be able to look at identifying children who may be at risk for future difficulties down the line. So they may be doing well now when they're 8 to 11 years of age, but we want to be able to follow up with these children in sort of 5 years, 10 years, and to be able to see what may have changed, what may have happened as a result of, um, you know, just kind of being in that family and in that, that school situation. So we had uh, about 126 families that we actually included in the study uh, that came in and participated with us. Uh, we had 33 families of children without ADHD um, and a number of teachers that were involved with the project as well. So all of the children in the ADHD sample did have a previous diagnosis, so we didn't actually do any of the diagnosis, but we did have them um, come in with, uh, with previous diagnoses. And these were some of the areas that we were looking at. So they came in for anywhere from three to six hours, depending on <laughs> how long it took the children to work through things over a couple of days. Um, and so we've looked at a whole range of different, uh, different abilities here. <coughs> Excuse me, we had a bilingual um, ADHD sample, we had a gifted ADHD sample, so we were able to look at some of these smaller clusters of, of children as well. Um, and we looked at a whole broad range of, of results. I just kind of put one page of general findings here. I could do an entire presentation on the, the work we got out of this project. I have done presentations on this. Um, basically what we found is that parents and children reported strengths in peer connectedness, sense of well-being, and family values. Consistently throughout a number of projects we saw, family was a big piece that came up. That connection with mom and dad or, or significant others was a, was a very important connection that we had. Um, and even tying into the idea of social support. So having support from parents, having support from teachers um, was very important. Interestingly, the thing that was the most important for these kids was having a connection with somebody other than their parents or their teachers. Somebody outside of their sort of their nuclear family unit, so whether it was an aunt or an uncle or a, a basketball coach or, you know, the neighbor's mother or whatever it was, having that connection with somebody else was one of the most protective factors that we've seen and it was, it's very consistent in the literature as well. It's having that person to be able to go to that's not mom and dad. So having that outside person was, um, was, strongly, was very strongly related to, to child outcomes, child well-being. We actually looked at father's um, input as well. We got some information from fathers, not just mothers. Um, one of my students looked at the relationship between sort of father's relationship with their children and behavioral outcomes and communication outcomes and the relationship between the father and child, the stronger the communication and the, the more positive that relationship. We also saw um, help to decrease relational frustration in the family as a whole. So having that strong male influence, uh, particularly we found that in the, the boys in our sample. We had more boys than girls obviously. Um, that was a key piece that, that came into play there as well. Um, I looked at the emotional intelligence side of things, which looks at how you're able to understand other people's emotions. So if I'm standing here with my arms crossed and scowling, you know, what does that mean? And how do you interact with me when I'm looking like that as opposed to smiling and, and happy? Um, and basically what we found there is very similar to what I talked about before, the whole idea of knowing what to do versus doing what you should do. So they could recognize the emotions, they know what they should do in, the, in these situations, but when it comes to actually doing something, um, even if they know that person is upset and should be left alone, it doesn't mean they're not going to go over and just give them one extra poke and kind of <laughs> get, get involved with them maybe when they know they shouldn't. So um, that was a really interesting piece as well to be able to say their emotional knowledge, their, their emotional understanding is equivalent to what we would anticipate with their same age peers. Um, but what we do see that difference is in terms of how they, how they recognize it or how they sort of interact with others who are demonstrating those you know, different types of emotions. Uh, so as I said, we, I could talk about a whole number of different areas here. We have a lot of different research here. So if there's specific things you're interested in, uh, by all means, questions on the chat board, or we can talk about it afterwards here. But um, this was just kind of an overview of some of the, the findings here. I think we had, we've had about five students that have worked through here in different stages of the project. So um, there's a lot, of, a lot of findings we've gone through. The Spark for Learning program um, is sort of our first foray into the schools to be able to do some actual school-based intervention. And I decided I would bring this here because when I actually talk about what the program is, you'll see it's not anything that you couldn't do at home. It's something that uh, we're just doing it in the schools because that's where there was interest. But by all means, you know, this can all be done at home without, without too much difficulty. 
Uh, it's built on the work of John Rady, who wrote a book, Spark, the Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain. And basically what he is advocating for is that, not that physical exercise cures everything, obviously, but that having 20 minutes of cardiovascular exercise first thing in the morning sets these kids up for learning throughout the course of the morning. And he's done, a, he had done a lot of research primarily based in animal models, but it's now moved into the, um, to the human side of things. But what we're looking at here is doing this exercise first thing in the morning triggers our brain, releases endorphins, releases all kinds of neurotransmitters that help us to be able to focus, to be able to concentrate, and to be able to move forward in our day more effectively. Right now I have this program, well it's running in a number of different schools. The two schools we're doing the, the primary research with are schools that are for children with learning disabilities, of which about half have ADHD. So they're kind of our target population for right now. Um, and they've been very generous with their time and their uh, sort of their involvement in this project. So the first period of every day, they do 20 minutes of cardiovascular activity. So their heart rates are up, they get to school, they get changed, they're out in the field or they're, you know, wherever it is they're doing their exercise for the day. Um, and they've seen huge changes in these kids over the course of, um, well, one school's been doing it, this is their third year we've been looking at them, and then we've got another school that's just come on board for this year. So we do know that there are huge links between exercise and the brain, and given the neurological components of ADHD, this is where we started to think that maybe we could look at how we can influence behavior in the classroom based on just kind of doing some of this physical activity first thing in the morning. Uh, there is a link here. There's, there was a CBC News article that, or a CBC News uh, video that was done on this about a year and a half ago. Um, so the link is here. That there's no internet kind of wired into this room, but the link is here if you would like to um, take a look at this. It's just a, you know, 30-second news clip. Um, but you can see some of the examples down here of what the, the kids and the teachers are doing. I should say that when at one of the schools, it's being done school-wide, so the teachers are doing it, the principal is there, the um, janitor likes to play basketball in the gym with the kids, so that's one of the activities they often do. Um, everybody is involved in this. The other school, they're kind of doing it in smaller, um, smaller groups, uh, but we're hoping to expand this to look at other populations as well. One of the um, Westmount Charter was really interested in getting involved, so they have uh, children who are highly intelligent. We've got other kind of populations that are running these kind of programs as well. What we've seen from the first kind of year, the first wave, um, is that when we look at student reports, we see that they're re reporting less anxiety over the course of the year. Um, they're looking at better, pay or better attention, they're less attention difficulties, less hyperactivity, uh, less inattention in the classroom. So these are kids who have academic difficulties, they've got known academic difficulties, which is why they're in these specialized programs, and um, teachers are saying, we can now get through curriculum. They show up, they've done their exercise, we can get through curriculum, they're, they're retaining so much more information, just because they've had that opportunity to kind of burn off some energy, wake themselves up, and then they're ready to go. And it's amazing, you go into the school after they've done their spark, 20 minutes and the school is silent. You'd think it would be crazy after they've just been running around and changing, but they get into their classrooms and it's silent. And then all you can hear is the teachers and they're starting to go through all of their work. So as I said, this is something that, you know, parents can do at home. It just, it's 20 minutes and then you can send them to school. It doesn't necessarily have to be at school. It's just, um, that's where we're doing it now. And you can see teachers have reported changes as well, the hyperactivity. Somatization um, is sort of the physical manifestations of anxiety, so headaches, stomach aches, sort of more of those physical complaints that we see with kids that uh, went down. Attention problems went down, so I guess attention would go up. Um, increases in adaptability, increases in leadership. One of the components we have in the program is that the students create some of the activities that they do, um, and then they teach others how to do it. So we've kind of incorporated that, um, the leadership components as well. This year our focus uh, is looking at the social emotional side of things. So I have a student who's looking at self-esteem, uh, changes in self-esteem over the course of the year. I have another one who's looking at emotion regulation, changes in emotion regulation over the course of the year. So we've done our pre-testing in September, October, and we'll be looking at the results of this in, I guess May and June, we'll be doing our, our second round of data collection. So, so yeah, this is an exciting project for us to be able to actually get into schools and start kind of putting programs into place where we can start to see some changes in these kids. So the third piece, uh, this is one of the newer projects that uh, I have coming up, partly because it was tied into the original strengths project that I was talking about, the whole idea of knowledge of ADHD. And I think this is something that 
Um, ADHD, despite the fact that it's been around for a while, it's a relatively poorly understood disorder. It's something where there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, you see a lot of things sort of on the news or, you know, media portrays things in one way or the other that may or may not be correct. Um, the front page of the New York Times last February was ADHD medication killed my kid. <clears throat> and then it went through this whole sad story about how this child was addicted to ADHD medication and ended up killing himself. And, you know, there was just so many inaccuracies in there in terms of what was reported, but, you know, this is the front page of the New York Times. This was a, there would have been heavy readership on something like this. So it's frustrating when, <coughs> excuse me, there's things that are out there that are, are misleading. And as I said, we see that ADHD is a result of, um, could be a result of bad parenting. We often think children are choosing to disobey. Um, we think that medication solves everything or nothing. There's a very polarized view on, on medication. Mm. Red food dye is always my favorite. There's been no research on anything to do with red food dye having an impact. Um, there may be individual kids who, when you take that out of their diet, they may be sensitive to it and it may have changes. So people may have found links, but consistently there's no um, indication that red food dye has, an in has any kind of impact on ADHD. And the same with sugar. I mean, obviously, if you give any child sugar, they're going to have much more activity. So whether that's exasperated for kids with ADHD or not, there's still some debate about how, how accurate that information is as well. So what I had done in this first study is we just kind of threw in this knowledge of ADHD scale. And let's just see, see what people know about it. It was 20 questions, um, true and false. It was completed by all the parents in the study, and some of the teachers completed this as well. <coughs> so we'll go through and we'll, we'll do a couple of them here. They're just true and false. So first question, ADHD can be inherited. What do we think, true or false? Just yell it out. Sorry? False, true, some mix. So ADHD is a very highly genetic disorder. So uh, what we do see is kids with ADHD, quite often we see some kind of link within the family. It doesn't necessarily have to be a parent. Um, we have cousins, aunts, uncles. Often we do see that if one if the child has a diagnosis of ADHD, then that's kind of the, the connection we see. I know one um, pediatrician, psychiatrist, I guess, he won't actually diagnose ADHD unless he can see the links in the genetic side of things. So there has to be some, for him, there has to be some kind of genetic component. So we do know that there is a, a strong genetic link there. ADHD occurs equally as often in girls as in boys. <laughs> So that one is false, <laughs> but again, the, the literature, we're not, you know, is it that we're identifying more boys because they have more of the hyperactivity and the girls are more calm? Or So th the answer for this one is false because right now we know that boys are diagnosed more strongly, but um, there's a little bit of debate as to, to how equal that is. A child can be appropriately labeled as ADHD and not necessarily present as overactive. <laughs> true. <laughs> I need to talk to you about the answers. <laughs> um, so true, yes. Yeah. So as, uh, as the question we had before, so there are different uh, subcategories of ADHD, which I realize I've taken out of the presentation once we got there. Um, so we can have children who are um, primarily hyperactive. We can have children who are primarily, primarily inattentive, or we can have a combination of both. So the hyperactive ones, typically we see that they're often the younger kids. So that's kind of some of the first behaviors we see. They're the ones who are up and running around and all over the place, can't sit still. I have a two-year-old nephew who I <laughs> can see that in very, very much. Um, he's up and around, can't sit still for anything other than Thomas. Thomas, he'll sit still for Thomas' tank engine. Um, the inattentive side of things, uh, we look here at the kind of kids who sit quietly in the classroom staring out the window. They're the daydreamers. They're the, you know, what did you say? You know, what's going on? They're a little bit out of, out of the loop, but they're not causing any behavioral concerns. Quite often we see that more in girls, which is why they're underdiagnosed, because they're not causing issues. Typically in a classroom, the kid who gets the attention is the one who's up and running laps, but the quiet ones who aren't getting work done often fly under the radar a little longer. And then we have the combined type, which has both of those together. So we, we have both the inattentive behaviors and we have the hyperactive behaviors. So a child can be identified as ADHD, but not overactive. ADD is a term that was used probably in the 80s and 90s and has now been sort of phased out. We don't talk about ADD specifically. We talk about ADHD and then we identify the subtype. So everything has the H in it now. 
Couple more questions. So children with ADHD always need a quiet, sterile environment in order to concentrate on tasks. False. Yeah, quite often what we see with kids with ADHD is that they're looking for stimulation. That's why they're continually active, why they're continually moving around, is they're seeking that stimulation, they're seeking that input. So to have an environment that's a, you know, white painted room with a desk and a pencil and that's it, quite often they, they don't have that stimulation that they're looking for. If a child can play Nintendo for hours, he or she probably doesn't have ADHD. <laughs> False. That's actually one that parents say, but he can sit and play Nintendo. It's kind of like I say, he can sit and watch Thomas. <laughs> um, what we see for kids here is it ties back into that stimulation. If you're playing a video game, you've got continual things happening on the screen. There's colors, there's lights, there's sound, there's activity. It's reinforcing for you. Uh, much more interesting than this page of math homework that you probably should be working on. So just because they can sit and pay attention to something that's really engaging for them doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have ADHD. So there was, I just put kind of five of them on there. So when we went through, there was, there was about 20 questions that um, parents and teachers answered. This is just a subset of them. I haven't put them all in here, as you can see by the numbers. So we had 89 parents that um, filled this out when I, when I counted this up. They had a mean average score of about 83%, so 16 to 17 out of 20, um, ranging from 10 to 20. So not too bad. Some parents are very knowledgeable about ADHD. They're up sort of 100%. And then we have some parents with, ADHD, or with kids with ADHD who are sort of scoring 50%, which is no better than guessing. You could have put true for everything and got 50%. So, um, you know, those are the parents that we kind of start to say, okay, we need to make sure we get some of that information to them. And same with looking at the teachers. So they scored about the same, um, uh, kind of 83, 84%. Again, the range of 12 to, to 19. And when the teachers survey, what we did is we actually looked at, there's a few kind of sub-questions that we asked for those teachers, um, just kind of about their training and their background with ADHD. So 78% had some training during their teacher education program, um, which is not too bad. Uh, I think, I, don't mean to throw the U of C under the bus here, since that's where I work, but they had a, their program did not acknowledge anything other than typically developing learners for quite a while, the program, the Masters of Teaching program. So now there's a new program that's been in place for the last couple of years. It has more of an emphasis on diverse learners rather than the kids who all sit nicely in their chairs. So I think that there's definitely some teachers that have gone out into the classroom that unfortunately don't have any background with any kind of exceptionalities, ADHD aside. So there's 78%, so it's not, not too bad. 71% had had a brief in-service workshop. Um, this was a bit concerning. 6% thought that maybe it was a legitimate disorder. So these are kid, teachers who have these kids diagnosed in their classroom. Those are the only ones that we contacted. So of that, two, you know, two or three of those teachers said, hmm, I don't know that this is a real disorder. So that was a little problematic to say, you know, you have these kids in your class. Um, but what was interesting is that 91% wanted more training on working with kids with ADHD, which I think really speaks to that education piece, to that knowledge piece, to that understanding of, you know, what do we know about these kids? How do we, how do we support them in the classroom? So what, that's kind of the, the direction that I'm looking at now is sort of how do we quell some of these misconceptions? How do we talk about what these kids actually can do and, and how do we support them in the classroom? Um, and how do we provide this training for teachers? How do we do you know, in-service workshops, or how do we get into schools to be able to actually talk to these teachers about these kids that are in their classroom. Again, two to three kids in almost every class will have um, some identification or some attentional difficulties. So that's the future directions of this project that um, I'm looking at is I'm, I just received funding just before Christmas to start expanding this. I'm interested in looking at parent views, child views, teacher views, professionals. You know, what, is, what do kids wish their teachers knew about ADHD? What do kids think that their parents should know? What do professionals know? What are professionals actually sharing with teachers and parents about ADHD? And, you know, the, the medical program gives you a three-hour afternoon lecture on childhood disorders in your program. That's a, that's a huge category, <laughs> three hours for, for all childhood disorders. So, you know, how much knowledge do they have and, you know, what are they actually sharing? So I think that's going to be a really important direction for us to understand what is the state of knowledge and then create the PD and the workshops to be able to help um, support kids, or help support the teachers and the parents who work with these kids. All right, so based on the research, how am I doing for time here? I don't have my... Okay, good. 
So based on this research, what can professionals do to help support these kids? And this is sort of the more of the take-home messages that we can look at is what kind of things can, kids, can, um, can parents do, can teachers do, how do we apply that to, to an actual sort of real-life child that we've met. Um, and I'll say here when I, I've got some suggestions and things we'll talk about is when you've met one kid with ADHD, you've met one kid with ADHD. So keep that in mind. So every child with ADHD presents differently. So I can give you some general suggestions as to how to work, but you may say, no, that's not going to work for this kid, and it probably won't because you know, they have such different nuances between them. So it'll be kind of finding the, the mix of interventions or the mix of supports that work specifically for an individual child. There's no magic pill. There's no magic intervention. If there was, you know, if I could create that, I, that would be great. <laughs> but I don't think that's, uh, that's in the cards. So just kind of understanding that there is a lot of individual differences within in this disorder. So I think one of the things that we need to focus on is identifying what works for kids. So just incorporating a whole, the whole notion of a strengths-based approach is really important. And I think it's something that we've started to try and advocate for. And you know, I've been at the university for three years now working with students who go through our clinics and um, students who are going out into the world to you know, practice as psychologists. And they've all taken this strengths-based Well, I've imparted my, my strengths-based approach on these individuals. So slowly we're going to try and get people out there who know how to look for things that these kids can do. And that just entails, you know, asking the parents, asking the kids what can they do. I've had parents say, no one's ever asked me what they're good at. Because you go to a parent-teacher meeting and it's all about, you know, they're not doing very well here and this is a problem and any phone calls you get are all of the the negative side of things. And so, you know, talking about what they can do can often be really encouraging for a child. Just hearing something that they did really well, you know, at the end of the day, you don't go home and say to your, your significant other or your family, you know, what sucked about your day to day? You said, what happened? What went well? You know, talk about the positives. You don't talk about the negatives. Yet that seems to be the focus that we have with these kids is, you know, how many checks did you get in your, in your agenda or how many X's did you get? And not to say that they're not good behavior management techniques, but it's, again, focusing on negative behaviors, not rewarding strengths. Uh, when I write psychological assessment reports, I always have a strength section in there. And it actually surprises a lot of schools and parents that there's an actual section that I put, you know, these are the things that this child can do. And there's always something you can find. There's always something. You know, it may not necessarily be academic. It may be athletic. It may be creative. It may be imaginative. It could, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, an academic subject that they're good at, but it can, there's be, there'll be something that they can build on. And so it's identifying those strengths and being able to share that information with other people can be really positive. Um, focusing on individual areas of support in terms of recommendations. So if, if a psych report says they're stronger verbally than visually, in working with those verbal skills. So instead of making them write everything out, have them use software programs where they can speak into the computer and it writes it out for them. Having them do presentations to their class. If they're eager to be the class clown and get up and show what they can do, give them a stage to do it on. Give them an assignment and then they can come up and they can they can present it. There's ways to sort of encourage them to, to build on what they can do without necessarily taking away from curriculum or, you know, from the, the specifics of what's actually supposed to be done. Uh, working with teachers is a really important thing as well. Um, obviously providing PD workshops, um, talking about individual families, talking about strengths, talking about just sort of the awareness of being able to look at what these kids can do is really important. Um, I've done, I don't know how many sessions in schools, any, but any school that asks me to come in and, and speak to them, I've done sessions with parents and teachers, and I have many, uh, many sessions that I've gone into schools, um, teachers conventions, things like that. Any opportunity to be able to talk about a positive way of looking at things is, is encouraging. And I think one of the nice things is that I'm being asked to do it. So there is interest, it just, we just have to slowly build some of that capacity to be able to actually talk about this with, with teachers. The social-emotional well-being um, piece, I think, is also a really important one. And it's not necessarily for those individual kids that are having difficulty. I think it becomes more part, more part of the school culture. So that's what I talked about with the Spark for Learning program. They did it school-wide. A few schools have started to do it across classrooms, and in, in regular classrooms as well. 
um, so that it's not just individual kids who are being selected for participation in these types of interventions, but it just becomes part of what they do. They work together, there's integration with all the teachers and all of the kids, and it's more of a focus on building capacity within the school rather than singling out individual kids and saying, you have this, you need support. You have this, you need support. It's building capacity across the school and across the school system rather than just looking at individual kids. <clears throat> when we work with parents, um, making sure that parents understand how ADHD can impact school, friendships, relationships, sort of all components of a child's life. It's not just an academic concern. It's not just a home concern. Um, we're looking at how does a child interact with their peers. Often we see the impulsivity and the hyperactivity can kind of get in the way of some of that because they're so eager to talk or they're so eager to do something with their friends that you know, the reciprocity of conversation can sometimes be problematic. So making sure parents know how to support kids in that area, making sure they know how to build capacity in their children, so whether that's social skills groups, whether that's um, you know, support for parents to help teach them some of those skills. It's sort of expanding our, our knowledge or thinking outside the box. Rather than saying, let's teach them about social skills, we can, you know, the, most of the kids know about social skills. The whole knowledge piece they have, it's the application of it. How do we get them to apply that? Connecting them with other adults, as I said, social support, uh, grandparents, family friends, aunts and uncles, you know, big brothers, big sisters is a, is a huge one to connect with. I know they have wait lists, which is sometimes difficult. But having another adult or another positive role model that's not their parents um, can have a huge impact. Extracurricular activities is another area. Uh, we were looking at extracurricular activities and, and creativity. Um, found some nice relationships there with social emotional well-being as well. Giving them an outlet that's not academic based. Something that they like to do. Um, I've had parents say, well, his math scores aren't high enough. He's not doing hockey this year. And I say, ah, oh, he needs to do the hockey to be able to work on the other things. You know, there has to be a balance there somewhere. So um, whether it's building on capacity, whether it's an opportunity to engage with, you know, different kids that are not at the classroom and not at the school and don't know what happens there, they just have that opportunity to engage with kids in a, in a different way with a really focused activity. You know, they've got hockey or they've got art or they've got whatever it is that they're working on can really help them to, to maintain focus and, and to work towards a common goal. Community resources, I'm sure that there's lots of information that comes out um, through, a well, through a number of means. Um, CHAD, the Children and Adults with Attention Deficit, uh, attention deficit Disorders, um, they have meetings at, at least in Calgary, they have them at the Children's Hospital um, the first Wednesday of every month. So they have parent support meetings. They have, uh, they're free, just anyone can, can go. Um, they have meetings for adults with ADHD as well, going on at the same time. So there's opportunities to be involved in sort of free support groups, meeting other parents, talking about strategies. They often have really good workshops and um, speakers coming to be able to talk about some of the um, challenges with ADHD or some of the, the things they can do to get over to support their children. Learning Disability Associations, communication with school is a really important one, making sure that everyone's on the same page. So if something is happening at home, making sure school knows about it. If there's behavioral strategies that work in one place, how to apply them into another setting as well. So these are just kind of more, those are sort of general how we work with those kids. This work here, the, the information I have here on optimizing successes in children with ADHD, this is sort of more from the literature. This isn't necessarily from the work that I've done, but what we know more generally about these kids is they perform better in one-on-one -on -one interactions. When, when we would all love to have one-on-one -on -one interactions. It doesn't necessarily mean they have to sit one-on-one -on -one with somebody all day, but just having those individual connections. So, you know, some teachers have special signals or signs for individual kids or just being able to walk around and um, touch them on the shoulder or say hi and things like that can be really important. Um, when the outcome or the reinforcement is near. So if you say, I'll give you a sticker today, and if you get five stickers on Friday, you can have, you know, a pizza party or you can have a five minutes of free time. It means very little to these kids. They can't, they can't think that far ahead. They can't wait that far. They need something now. So it needs to be something reinforcing now. Otherwise, they, they'll forget by the time they get to the, to the end of the week. Um, engaged and motivating um, when they're doing activities that they have interest in. So a lot of times I recommend to teachers that if they're doing, if you have to have a specific, you want them to write a specific story or, you know, have, a, have an assignment, let them pick the topic. Be flexible in terms of what they write on or flexible in terms of how they present it or think about things 
that are not just sitting down and writing, you know, five sentences on a page. How else could you, how else could they demonstrate their knowledge and being able to do it in an engaging way? And sometimes just sitting down and being able to use um, Dragon Naturally Speaking or Read Write Gold, which are speech to text programs, make a huge difference for these kids. They just speak into the computer, it writes it out for them, they can do the editing, they get the information there, it's just they don't have to sit down and, and do the handwriting every time. Uh, in the morning, they're much better. Uh, high levels of stimulation. This is a big one, feeling accepted, respected, and appreciated. A lot of times the kids with ADHD are the ones that are continually, you know, referred to the office or they have, you know, discipline of some description. Um, and sometimes just kind of trying to keep them in the classroom rather than sending them out. Um, that was one of the big things actually we noticed with the Spark for Learning program is that kids are less likely to be sent out of a classroom because they had they were part of this community, they were part of the school, they felt like they were getting along with their classmates a lot better, and so they actually saw a pretty significant decline in um, behavioral problems and office referrals as a result of being involved in this physical activity program. So whether that's a result of just the activity or whether it was more sort of the community and the accepted and respected um, side of things, we, we definitely saw that as well. At school, um, obviously having clear expectations of rules um, is even more important for these children. Often teachers have schedules on the board or the kids can have them in their binders or on their desk. For these kids, it's particularly important because it gives them an idea of what's coming up next. They know what their day looks like. When we talked about flipping back and forth between subjects and, you know, the, the clothes and the vegetables, it, you know, it's hard to keep flipping back and forth. But if you have things laid out, you know what to expect. You know what comes first. You know what comes next. You know how you're going to get through the course of the day. As I said, talking about um, having choices, teaching the skills. Uh, I think teaching the skills is the really important one. They have the knowledge. Social skills groups, as I said, are, are not really that useful for these kids, depending on the groups, um, because the focus is teaching knowledge. They have the knowledge. They know what to do. It's how do you get out into the playground and actually have these real life scenarios. It's almost like if you could have a little person sitting on their shoulder and they get into a situation and the little person's like, okay, stop, you know, what do you need to do? And just kind of takes that second to remind them and then they can, they can proceed. It, but obviously, we can't follow kids around all the time, but um, having that opportunity to kind of reinforce those skills is, is really important. Linking skills to real life situations is another one. So they ha children with ADHD often have a very hard time with very abstract um, concepts and abstract, you know, in the future or when, when this happens or when that happens. They, they seem to work much better when they have some kind of concrete, you know, idea or situation that they can work with. And obviously that's not always the case. As you move up, you, you deal with much more abstract concepts. But as much as possible, if you can tie it to real life concepts, it seems to be helpful. So, for example, when kids are learning fractions, I tell the parents to go home and get out the cookie sheets and start making cookies. When you talk about, we need a half cup of this and a quarter cup of this and a full cup of this, and they can actually see conceptually what that looks like and how it all kind of plays together. So they need to have a way to take these abstract concepts and make it more real. Uh, technology is another really useful component. Um, I think as long as you work on the premise that it's tools, not toys, then it seems to work relatively well in the classroom. So being able to use the information to help support the learning, um, not as a way to have free time and you know, play games on your, on your computer or your iPad or whatever you have. But um, technology seems to, to work really well for these kids, partly because of the stimulation and the engagement. So we have in the, um, I teach an academic assessment class at the university, and we had the librarian come in, and she, we have a, a class set of iPads that have all of these academic apps on them. So there's a whole number of games of Math Ninja and all these kind of free na games they can do, and it's, they're doing all the math concepts, but you know, every time you answer a question, the ninja guy chops the fruit, and then it moves to the next question, and then you do it again. So there's ways that you can incorporate technology that they're getting this repetition, they're getting some of these skills, and maybe they don't realize it, you know, like they don't realize that that's what they have to do. So I think incorporating technology, um, not all the time, but definitely sometime, can be a, can be a benefit. Uh, at home, uh, as we talked a little bit about some of this, I think the big one here is um, we didn't actually look at siblings in, in our, any of our studies thus far, um, but I do know that when we were talking to kids with ADHD, they said they didn't get along very well with their siblings, and we talked to parents, and they definitely saw a lot of conflict. 
So I think it's really important to consider the impact of ADHD on siblings and that how that affects the family as a whole. And that it's not necessarily just, you know, that one child that you need to deal with. There you have, you know, siblings that also have some kind of uh, role to play in this and how do you kind of in include them as well. Obviously every family will be slightly different, but just being, a being aware of other kids and sort of that relationship can be really important. Um, consider the benefits of having a pet. And I put this on here because at one point somebody asked me, they said, well, you know, we've tried all the extracurriculars, we, you know, we, they don't want to do it, they can't do it, you know, what else can we do to help with responsibility and things like that? And, and one of the other parents in the room said, you know, get a pet. It doesn't have to be a dog or, you know, a golden retriever. It can be a goldfish, like it's something small. But the responsibility for that child starts to grow when they have something that's theirs and that they have to care for. So it was another way of looking at how to help instill responsibility, um, you know, sort of taking care of something, being able to manage, you know, that, having a little bit of control over, you know, the, the 99 cent goldfish that can be easily replaced if, <laughs> if needed. Um, so yeah, so that, I thought that was an interesting one, so I included that there because it seemed to work quite well for, for that one family. Um, having rules, codes of conduct for family, um, yeah, importance of sleep, exercise, and proper nutrition. I have actually done presentations on ADHD and sleep, um, looking at sort of the huge relationship between those two concepts, I guess, or those two, those two uh, ideas. Um, kids with ADHD are notoriously bad at falling asleep and sometimes staying asleep. Um, their minds just are continually seeking that stimulation and you get them in bed at 8.30 or 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock, whatever time they go to bed, um, it often takes them a long time to fall asleep, which can of course have an impact on their academic performance the next day if they've only had you know, a few hours sleep and they need more. So um, definitely the importance of sleep routines, uh, making sure that they're calm and, and relaxed before they're going to bed and, you know, getting away from video games and computers and things like that early enough that they're able to settle their minds. Um, there's quite a lot of research looking at the whole idea of the, the correlation between sleep and, and ADHD. And parent self-care is another one that I think is really important. Um, a lot of times these kids are very exhausting. You know, there's a lot of energy, there's a lot of uh, things that are going on, a lot of managing, and if parents aren't in a, a mind frame to be able to deal with it, then that's going to be problematic for working with those kids as well. So I think that's a, another important concept to, to think about. Whatever that looks like, whether it's, you know, leaning on family and having your own so set of social supports, um, whether that's, you know, just kind of finding time for one person to to have a, you know, a bath by yourself kind of thing, rather than having kids running around all over the place. But I think, um, I think that's a really important thing that we often overlook as well, is that we're so focused on the kids, we're not looking at the people who are trying to support those kids as well. So it's an important piece to, to include. Uh, last, ooh, last couple of slides here with peers, um, just sort of setting kids up to, to win when they're working with peers. So not just saying, yeah, here you go, here's you know, a friend, come over, throw them in the basement and let them play. They may need a little bit more supervision than that. They may need a little bit more direction to help manage situations that kind of that come up um, so that they're not just you know, sort of left to manage problematic situations themselves. They may need some guidance as to how to walk through situations that come up. Um, allowing ch children to save face is also really important. So rather than, um, you know, say getting mad at them in front of their friends, being able to talk about it privately and what you should do and how you should do it, um, especially with these kids because they're so impulsive and they're so reactive that if a parent reacts, often the kid reacts and then the escalation starts and it um, can be problematic. So having, ha allowing the kids a little bit of time to save face can, can often help in terms of what they've learned and what they've taken away from that situation also helps to keep that relationship with the parent and the child intact rather than sort of becoming a bit more fractured. Um, and becoming informed. So the last couple of slides here, uh, as I talked about sort of the whole knowledge side of things, um, reminding yourselves, reminding others that kids aren't necessarily doing this deliberately. Um, most of the time there are, there are difficult situations obviously. Um, that the neurological component is a really important aspect. So we need to understand that it, the way that they're thinking about things is slightly different than the way others may think about things. Doesn't mean they're not thinking about the same things, they just, the way they get there can sometimes be a little bit different. And that the education of ADHD is such an important component. I'll just put a little um, kind of plug in here for this certificate program that I had created. There's a whole number of them that we run through the University of Calgary. They're graduate level programs that look specifically at different components. So one of the things, one of the programs that I created looks at ADHD. So it's a four-course graduate program 
um, that looks at ADHD across each of these areas. Um, so really get an understanding of what is ADHD, how do we work with these kids. Um, we've had a lot of teachers take it, social workers have taken it, administrators have taken it. Um, we also have, I have one on children's mental health, we have one on autism, we have, you know, working with bilingual kids, it's kind of a whole spectrum of education side of things. So um, there's, a, there's a whole number of courses that if you're looking for further professional development, we can go through, um, look at the University of Calgary website as well. Uh, so last slide here in conclusion. Um, uh, basically what I'm hoping that you take away from this is that we need to look at moving away from the whole deficit approach and moving towards more of that strengths-based understanding. Again, we're not ignoring the things that um, these children have difficulties with, but we're looking at better ways to support them. So how do we have more of a balanced approach when we, we understand the deficits, but we also use that information to help strengthen the areas they're good at and help support them in areas they may need a little bit of extra support. Pro we're looking to provide a more positive message to parents, children, and schools. So looking at what they can do, um, bringing in sort of the whole idea of resilience and overcoming uh, obstacles, overcoming adversity to help empower these children to be successful. So as I said, a number of kids with ADHD are successful. What we need to do is look at how do we encourage that in kids that may be having a little bit more difficulties at this point. Uh, of course, lots of acknowledgement and thanks to collaborators that I have, students that have worked on this project, um, a number of funding sources, including ACCFCR, SHRC, the Carlson family, uh, ACES, and the University of Calgary. So a number of different people have been involved in this project. Um, I'll leave my contact information up there as well. You're welcome to get a hold of me directly if you want information on some of the work that our lab does. Uh, we're in the process of updating our website with some of the new information, but um, you're welcome to check out the lab website that we have there, the ADHD Kids. Um, yeah, we will be posting information on there for recruitment and things like that for upcoming studies, probably in about four or five months. So keep an eye on that if you're interested in being part of that as well. So thank you very much for your time. So I have eight questions so far okay. from the webcast. Uh, when a child has, uh, Karen asks, when a child has ADHD and other behaviors, do you have to use different strategies for parenting and calming? and wondered if the behavior needs different strategies. Um, so basically, if the behavior is the more prevalent component, the ADHD, what kind of things would you look at? Um, it, yeah, as I said, every child with ADHD is slightly different. So um, if this child has more of the behavioral components, then yes, that would obviously need to be an area that's addressed first. Um, there are m manuals, ODD manuals, behavioral manuals that you can get online and from pediatricians that really focus on behavioral contracts, behavioral modification, um, sort of working with the behavioral component. Often once you get that side of things um, managed or under control, then you can help work with the ADHD side of things. So if that's the primary concern that that family has, then absolutely that's the way they can, the place they can focus first. Okay, now for some controversy. Uh, <laughs> okay. In the U.S., 9% of school-aged children have been diagnosed with ADHD. In France, that number is less than 1%. French doctors argue that it's underlying issues that need to be treated and not the symptoms. What are your thoughts on this? I think that's definitely a, a, a question that's come up a number of times. If you look at the prevalence throughout the world, different countries have different prevalence rates. So. If, yeah, France would be 1%, the U.S. is 10%, Canada is about the same. Um, a lot of it comes down to how willing people are to diagnose. Uh, a lot of it comes down to stigma that's related to a diagnosis um, and how willing people are to accept that. Um, and some of it comes down to how willing parents are to kind of move forward and actually, you know, seek support for their children. So. Um, I think different countries, depending on how, what kind of diagnostic criteria they use, they may identify more or less. I think in the States, they maybe gear, um, lean a little bit more towards overdiagnosis. They often throw medication or sort of throw labels at, at the condition rather than figuring out what happens, what kind of is going on underneath the, um, you know, some of the symptoms that are prevalent. And that's why I talked about having a, a diagnosis done by a psychologist or done by somebody who's done some assessment with the child and not just, you know, watch them for a few minutes at school or in a playroom. So I do think that um, different countries have different ways of looking at things and that, you know, it, it's, it 
can be up to the parents and up to the, the family doctors as to how, how much that's diagnosed. All right, webcast questions can continue. Is there anyone in the room with something they'd like to ask? <clears throat> questions I'll mm -hmm. treat the two quickest ones um, the diagnosis should that be coming from the doctor or should it be coming from a psychologist um, both can do it medical professionals can can make those diagnoses so there's not necessarily an advantage of one over the other sometimes doctors are a little bit more limited in the amount of time that they have so a psychologist um, usually spends more time with a child but they often you know, you have to pay for an assessment or get an assessment covered, whereas medical, it's a bit different. So both of them would be acceptable. Yeah. Okay, and my second question is, um, you said there's a study done with the exercise first thing in the morning, 20 minutes. What about exercising later on in the day? Does the benefits not seem to be... Usually what, well, what has been found is that the exercise, when they do the exercise first thing in the morning, you see the benefits throughout the morning at school. So if they do it in the afternoon, that's fine. It's just you wouldn't necessarily see the exercise benefits carry over to the next day. So it's the same even at this school, the afternoon. They've, they're fortunate in that they're able to schedule their phys ed classes in the afternoon or, or right before lunch. So they try to see the benefits throughout the course of the day but the other school doesn't have that luxury, and so the afternoon they're seeing the benefits of the exercise starting to, I guess, kind of wear off. So, you know, physical activity in general is, is a positive thing to have, but if you're looking for the specific ex benefits of the cardiovascular exercise, it's usually just following the exercise. And another question from the web is, how has diagnosis of ADHD changed or improved? I've heard some discussion or confusion between mm -hmm. what is trauma-based presentations versus being ADHD. Uh, well, we just came out, the, the DSM-5 has just come out, so the Diagnos Diagnostic and Statistical Manual um, that we use to make these diagnoses. There hasn't been a lot of changes from the previous edition, a couple of, a couple of very small things, but for the most part, the diagnostic criteria have been the same since kind of the mid-90s, I guess, was when the last revision came out. Um, so it's continually updated and kind of tweaked, but uh, there hasn't been a huge number of changes in the specific presentation. Um, I think that the trauma piece is becoming a little bit more, I think we're becoming a little bit more aware of the, the role that trauma plays. Um, and I think that that's an important piece to consider. There can be situations in which when a child comes and there's a number of things going on, ADHD may be one component, but if the trauma is sort of the more prevalent component, I would want to look at managing that first and then looking at the ADHD subsequently. Um, and it's the same with any, if, if the child comes and there's a number of things going on, you want to treat the most prevalent or the most worrisome condition first and then maybe look at understanding other conditions subsequently. So in that situation, if there's potential for the trauma to be more important or sort of more prevalent, I'd want to look at that first and then understand if there's still the ADHD type symptoms afterwards. Yeah. So with, uh, following up on mm -hmm. the um, exercise piece, it occurs to me that as I sort of sit back and watch my grandchildren versus my kids, they take the bus, they don't mm -hmm. walk to school, they mm -hmm. don't come home at lunch and walk back and forth. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm just curious if, if that's been looked at or kind of built into this piece. It just seems to make so much sense that these kids need now some kind of organized activity at school to do what their usual sort of routine would have done before. Yeah, yeah that's a really good point, actually. And it's actually one of the reasons why the um, the school had initially brought in this type of a program because just the type of school that they are, they take kids from all over the city. So some kids are on the bus for an hour in the morning. By the time they get up, they get dressed, they get on the bus, they've fallen asleep for that hour because by the time they get to school, they're, they're tired again. So that was one of the things that um, they had noticed is that the kids are coming in, they're sluggish, they're tired, they're grumpy. And so they needed that sort of, you know, exercise to wake them up. Um, and I think that just the way our society has moved forward, we don't have to be as active if we don't want to. We can take the escalator or the elevator. We don't have to take the stairs. We, you know, people will drive to the store that's 10 minutes away as opposed to walking, which is maybe what used to be more prevalent. So I think that, yeah, the way in which we 
can manage things or the, the types of exercise we could get, sometimes we choose not to. And so especially for kids when they need to have their 60 minutes a day, you know, it becomes harder to get it when they're on the bus for an hour or, you know, whatever it is that takes up their time, computer for an hour instead of outside playing. So that, yeah, that's a really good point. What are the long-term effects of not treating ADHD? Long-term effects? Um, it depends on the individual child. If they're able to develop coping strategies, then they may be able to manage situations. Um, if they're continually having difficulties at school, academics can suffer. Obviously, there can be long-term implications of that if they're not graduating from high school and things like that. Um, but it really depends on the individual child. If they're able to develop the coping strategies even without any specific intervention, um, then they may be fine. But if they're continually struggling and, um, you know, there's definitely some relationships between ADHD and um, car accidents and um, it can be opportunities for them to get into more significant behavioral problems. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that every child will go that way, but there's definitely higher risk. It's definitely a riskier situation. I think there was an interest in knowing if uh, it would have any implications on mental health issues down the road, if it exacerbated. Um, potentially. Um, what we often find with kids with ADHD is the mental health issues that come in often come from feeling uh, sort of the poor self-esteem and the poor self-concept because they're always getting in trouble or they feel like they can't do something or, you know, there's always sort of the, the negative cloud around them because they never, um, they don't seem to get a lot of positive support. So in that sense, the mental health can definitely be affected. Um, longer term, I don't know if there's been any studies that have specifically looked at untreated ADHD and longer term mental health outcomes, but I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, if they had no support that the, the longer term mental health would suffer as well. Do you know of any studies where uh, children who had been diagnosed with both ADHD and FASD had the um, help from the, the ADHD medication, did it help their FASD symptoms? How oh, FASD and ADHD have some similarities, but some significant differences as well. So in terms of looking at how medication would help, basically ADHD medication is a stimulant. So what it does is it provides the brain with the extra, I guess, stimulation that it's looking for to help the child kind of sit down and relax. It seems a little counterintuitive that when you give them a stimulant, it helps them kind of sit down and relax. So in terms of the symptoms of, or the, the presentation that you see with FASD, it would help with some of the hyperactivity side of things, but it wouldn't necessarily uh, help with some of the other symptoms that we see with, a, with FASD in terms of sort of verbal behaviors and, and things like that. So you would be able to treat the symptoms that overlap with ADHD, but not necessarily anything in addition to that. Thank you for your time. Uh, but building on a lot of the, these questions where there's uh, components of trauma and I'm asking about actually when there are major disruptive life changes for a child that has been diagnosed with ADHD, do you believe the modality for services in therapy is better suited for play therapy or traditional modalities? Again, that would be an individual child situation and, and the age of the child may have uh, have an impact on that as well. Um, I do think that whenever there's a, a big sort of a traumatic situation or a, a significant life event, that often that can supersede some of the, the attentional concerns. Um, that often encompasses their life as opposed to, it, well, ADHD obviously encompasses their life, but I think a lot of times that trauma is sort of becomes the, the forefront and that's the issue that needs to be dealt with first. Um, I think if there's the opportunity to do something active, that would help with ADHD, so more of the play therapy side of things. But again, uh, you know, if you're going to try and get a 15-year-old boy into play therapy, it's, depending on what you're doing, it may or may not be successful. Um, so I think it would just be kind of working with that individual child. I do think trauma is a bit of a unique situation where you need to deal with the, the here and now a little bit more sort of presently rather than um, kind of focusing on the ADHD. They do work. They, they do kind of play off each other a little bit, but um, in that situation, yeah, focusing on the trauma and incorporating any of the behaviors or the supports that would also account for the ADHD would be the most beneficial. Have research findings uh, been published and where can we hunt these down? 
So you were... My uh, research? Your research, <laughs> yeah. When you were talking, I think that it was in regards, this question came when you were talking about your Alberta Centre for Child, Family and Community Research Centre okay. funded project. And so they're wondering also if you had done any previous research and if those findings have been published and where can they find them? Um, yes, there's some things that have come out. Um, actually, the, the nicest summary that I have for the ACCFCR is uh, the report that we submit at the end. So that is available on the ACCFCR website. There's a, I don't know how long it is, a 20-page document that kind of summarizes everything that we've done in that study. So, And we will post that as a resource uh, yeah. following this session on the website page and email out to everyone who registered. Okay, yeah, so that's, that's definitely posted online. Um, there are some articles that have been submitted that we're waiting to get back. There's some book chapters that have gone out as well. So, um, yeah, there, if, if there's specific things that they're looking for, um, they're welcome to send me an email. And if there's things I can send out, then I'm, I'm happy to do that as well. I have a plethora of questions from the webcast. <laughs> okay. There's some in here as well. <laughs> oh, sorry. There's a thousand people on the webcast, so I'm trying to be fair. Sorry. <laughs> um, relationship between sleep and ADHD. This person has heard that ADHD is often mis misdiagnosed when, in fact, um, it's actually sleep concerns. Do you support this? Well, as I said, that fatigue can be one of the things that is often looks like ADHD. So um, it depends on, you know, what kind of sleep difficulties they're having, and if it's attentional related and the child's falling asleep in class, then yes, it, it could be ADHD, but it could also be the, the fatigue side of things. So um, again, it's one of those situations where you'd need to look and see if it's the sleep or if it's more of the attentional concerns. So um, they could be misdiagnosed. It's one of the, the look-alikes that I have on there for that exact reason that it, it needs to be considered, yeah. Firstly, I'd like to say that I enjoyed the um, caller reading exercise. <laughs> Thank okay. you for that. You did very well on it. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my question is, um, you've mentioned that um, physical exercise first thing in the morning is beneficial. Mm -hmm. How about mental exercise first thing in the morning, whether technology assisted or not? Um, we haven't looked specifically at those type of, of tasks. A lot of, a lot of the activities they do um, require sort of coordination and thinking and their games so there's you know there's kind of the the mental component with that um, I don't know if you could sit down and do sort of math minutes first thing in the morning then potentially that would um, sort of get them active I don't think you'd see the same kind of benefits as you'd see from the physical activity just because what happens during the physical activity is um, the the specific neurotransmitters that are released as are as a result of the, the movement um, so yes, you could look at some of those mental math or mental activities to sort of get them going, but I think you'd find more benefits with the physical side of things. Yeah, potentially later in the day that might be um, an option. We just we haven't. Yeah, it's something to consider. Is maybe we had another group that was just doing mental activities. Yeah. Yeah. Are there notable statistics about these children, specifically adolescents who suffer from headaches? Children with ADHD, do they present with, with more headaches? headaches? Yeah. I'm not sure about that. I don't necessarily know if there's specific relationships between those two. That's, yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't have an answer for that one. <laughs> no problem. And somebody was asking, uh, because we have people that are watching this webcast from across Alberta, across Canada, mm -hmm. Uh, they would like to know if those courses that you posted are available via distance learning. They are all distance learning courses, so you can only take them online. So, yeah. So, um, as a mother of an ADHD child and a teacher of many ADHD children <laughs> over my years, I have a question in regards to um, how would you go about, you said that uh, sibling interactions is a huge one that I see quite a bit mm -hmm. because they miss a lot of social cues. Mm -hmm. Is it appropriate and at what age can you start discussing with the siblings? Um, your sister has ADHD. This is like, I don't want to label her mm -hmm. and I don't, but is it appropriate to discuss with her sister why her sister is the way she is or what she does and at what age do you start to do that, I guess? Yeah, there's, there's always the question of do you, do you tell a, a teacher, do you tell people about a diagnosis and when do you do it? 
Um, I think it would depend on the age of the, the sister, I guess. Um, and I think it would be something where you don't necessarily have to say they have this and this is what it is. They c you can just talk more generally about, you know, some people have difficulties interacting in this way. I mean, she'll go out to school and she'll find kids that have difficulties interacting in, in other ways as well. So um, I do think sometimes it's important to be able to talk about things openly so that it's not a secret and it's not something that you don't know why they're doing this or why they're doing that. But being able to talk about, okay, in this situation, if this happens, how do we, how do we solve it? And you can have that conversation with, with both of them. It doesn't have to be one child over the other. But yeah, sometimes just giving, having a bit of awareness for the um, for the sibling to say, you know, sometimes they have difficulties with this, and in that situation, you need to be able to, you know, be patient or come and get find an adult or whatever the the situation is. In terms of age, when I have that conversation, it really de depends on a child. Yeah, maturity. A five-year-old can be mature enough for that conversation, and a seven-year-old could not be mature enough for that conversation. So it kind of just depends on what they're actually able to to understand. I think. And the final question for sure. today's presentation is, what strategies would you recommend for children with ADHD and speech communication delays as problem solving, which requires lots of language, internal and external, would be difficult? Uh, in that situation, I'd probably m try to include as much visual information as I could. So obviously, speech language can be both visual and verbal, but if you have the, the visual components for them, um, whether that's stories, whether that's pictures, whether that's expressing themselves through those visual means, um, I think that would take some of the language out. Obviously, working on building those language skills would be, would be useful, would be important. Technology would play a really strong role here as well both in terms of being able to finish schoolwork, but also in terms of strengthening the, the language skills and sort of managing some of the ADHD behaviors. So that would, that would be my suggestion for that. Thank you. Good. Thanks. So thank you very much, Dr. Climby. That was very interesting with some tangible um, things that people can take away. Um, so thank you very much. I also want to uh, thank the audience both in the room and on the webcast and for your participation and great questions and uh, those that participated in doing those activities up on the screen. A uh, reminder that the presentation has been recorded and will be available online. Follow-up evaluation and the link to the recording will be emailed to them. The certificate of attendance will be emailed to you once you have completed the evaluation. The next session in the series takes place on Tuesday, February 4th at the Radisson South Hotel in Edmonton. Our guest speaker will be Dr. Wanda Polzin. Dr. Polzin will be, pre be presenting on vicarious trauma for frontline service providers and parents. More information will follow on the website. Thank you very much. Can I just say as well that if there's any other questions that we didn't get to online, you're welcome to send me an email and I'll, I'll do my best to, to get back to you. Um, if there's lots of questions, it may take me a couple of days, but, <laughs> but I am okay with that as well. <laughs>